Okay. okay, let's get started. So, um, welcome to tonight's So I Said Your Taiwan Studies um, seminar. Uh, tonight, I'm uh, delighted to uh, welcome uh, Douglas McNaught uh, for the latest in our uh, Contemporary Taiwan Indigenous Studies uh, lecture series. The, the series is sponsored by the uh, Shuni Museum uh, in Taiwan. And what we're trying to do in this series uh, is to run a, 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 a series of lectures that look at contemporary um, issues related to Taiwan's uh, indigenous uh, people. So we've, uh, we've already had sessions on uh, politics um, um, uh, related to Taiwan's indigenous people. And today we're going to switch the um, uh, theme to one that we cover in, in our teaching, uh, and that's language education. But tonight the focus is on uh, indigenous language uh, education. Um, it's something that we've, we, we have kind of touched upon over the last... Uh, few years. For example, in uh, Anita Jung's um, documentary, Tongues from Tongues of Heaven, or Tongues from Heaven, um, and also uh, back in 2015, the at uh, the World Congress, one of our keynote speeches by Li Renkui uh, looked at um, indigenous languages and, and the, uh, uh, the, uh, the degree that they were under threat. One of the things that really stands out in my mind from that lecture was the way that he was he was telling us, okay, um, so and so language, it's going to be extinct. Um, but within so many uh, years. And I know for your PhD, you were also looking at, uh, uh, at a language close to extinction on, 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 yeah. on that. Uh, it must have been on, on Li Yunkwe's um, uh, list. Um, uh, uh, Douglas um, did his uh, PhD at SOAS in uh, linguistics, uh, which, which kind of makes me feel uh, quite guilty. Um, normally, I, I get our PhD students who are working on Taiwan to um, give um, Central Taiwan Study seminars, usually from about year two, year three, uh, but it's taken me too long. I really apologise for this, because um, uh, Douglas has already, um, he's done his PhD uh, viva in, in December, um, and he's in the process of uh, completing his uh, revisions. And in the meantime, he's also uh, um, working full time um, in the process of uh, doing a PTC in uh, language education, so he's uh, um, delighted that he could kind of find the time uh, um, um, after starting work at eight o'clock this morning with. Is it primary school you're doing? Secondary, Secondary school. school. Okay, that's that's even tougher actually. Oh yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, so. Um, um, let's give uh, Douglas a very big um, uh, SOAS welcome home. Thanks very much. Is this okay? Can you hear me? Very well. Yeah. Move very well. Excellent. I actually got my PhD supervisor sitting right there, so uh, no pressure. <laughs> <laughs> what has he learned in the last five years? <laughs> well, it's probably not a lot, maybe. We'll see. <laughs> No, but thanks for having me. Um, yeah, I did my PhD on um, a grammatical uh, analysis of a, a certain part of um, the Sakizaya language. That's one of the Taiwanese, uh, the one of the most languages, about 300 speakers. Uh, and so this is what really got me on to, uh, although I'm, I, I looked at it from a, a kind of a linguistic grammatical analysis, I was very interested in um, re revitalization processes and how uh, languages were being, were being taught and, and, uh, and how these materials were being created. And I found out, uh, after living there for a while, that there was actually a lot lacking, um, both in the grammatical descriptions of the languages and in the resources that were being uh, used in the schools. And so uh, a lot has been written about the, the process of um, uh, educational policy in the past. Um, and I don't want to focus on that too much. I'd like to talk more about kind of the pedagogical processes that are being used in schools, problems of resource development, and issues that are now affecting language learning, uh, such as uh, particularly urban migration, and, and not being able to access mm -hmm. language teachers, and, uh, and what's being done to kind of solve these problems. Okay, so uh, just a brief outline, I'll, I'll introduce the indigenous people and uh, a little bit about their languages, and then I'll look at the colonial history and its effect on language loss. Um, then we'll move into the history of indigenous language education starting from uh, 1990 up to uh, kind of 2001. And then we'll look at uh, the, the current state of affairs, what are the main problems um, with 
a case study on Sangla, who's a good friend of mine, who's an indigenous uh, language. She's a Sakizaya and Amis teacher in Hualien, so we'll look at uh, her classes and her, her methods. Uh, and then we'll move on to kind of looking at the future uh, of education in terms of what uh, what's the potential um, to improve the situation in Taiwan and what steps are already being taken to, to have a, a positive impact in the future. Okay. So, do you want to take a picture? <laughs> 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 no. Okay. No. It's a nice slide, isn't it? <laughs> so obviously those tattoos are... Uh, uh, some of the old, the old folks in their like 90s and 100s still have them, uh, but uh, there's a couple of guys that you can see, uh, young young people in their 30s and 40s that have kind of tried to bring that back, but there's not many people. I saw a guy on a, on a train once with one of these tattoos, which just means a truku. You went to me to what? Get one myself. Oh, yeah. uh, I think it would be quite insulting, wouldn't it? Yeah. If I walked around with an indigenous tattoo, but uh, no. Uh, so they. The Formosan, uh, well, the, the, the ind indigenous population of Taiwan are an Austronesian people, so they're not related uh, genetically, I mean, well, what's the word? Yeah, yeah genetically, or in terms of their heritage and linguistically, or linguistically, to the Chinese, to the uh, Sino Tibetan languages. Uh, they've been living on the island for at least 5,000 years, if not longer. Um, Currently, there are 16 recognized tribes still in existence. About 10, like originally, I think there were about 26 languages, and about 10 have gone. Uh, 16 are still spoken, and within those 16, there are various dialects that uh, may or not, may or may not be regarded as kind of separate diversions of their own. Right, uh, and they're loosely uh, divided into the plains tribes and the mountain tribes. But uh, the ones that are essentially recognized are the. Are the Mountain tribes. I think the only one, the only plains tribe that have been officially recognized by the government are the Kabalan. Um, the rest, because of uh, assimilation processes, are all pretty much uh, gone. Um, the number in just over uh, half a million, about two percent of the population of Taiwan, and the vast majority are uh, Christian or Catholic of, of some kind, uh, due to a long process of missionary work going back at four hundred years. Um, so of the 26 known languages, 10 are extinct, 5 more abundant, and several several are, are threatened. Uh, yeah, in the language I was looking on, there's about 300 speakers. Most of them are 70, 60 years old, 60, 70 years old and, and above. Uh, very few indigenous speakers uh, below the age of 50 are uh, fluent or have any kind of degree of fluency. Um, the languages, oh, I don't know languages, but they're, they're, they're verb initial, uh, they're morphologically very complex. Um, they're defined by a thing kind of like a call to voice system. It's just a grammatical. It doesn't matter. I won't talk about it. Uh, but the, the same kind of system is found in, in languages in the Philippines and uh, um, elsewhere. Well, no, mainly just the Philippines. Uh, and Taiwan is regarded as the homeland of the Austronesian languages, which is the largest geographically uh, and in terms of number of languages, one of the largest uh, linguistic families in the world. Um, it stretches from Madagascar all the way uh, across. Um, um, the Indian uh, and the Pacific Ocean over to Hawaii and Easter Island. Um, the Formosan languages have a very special place in that, in in, in the history of this. In that, um, of of the, uh, of the of the kind of the the, the the ten major branches of of the Austronesian language family, nine are found in Taiwan, and then one, a long time ago, left and became all the other languages that you see. So in terms of the linguistic um, complexity and diversity, Taiwan is a, is a real gem. Uh, there's, there's a lot of good uh, work that needs to be done there, to, uh, descriptive work that still needs to be done. So I like this picture because you can see the, you know, the beautiful uh, Aboriginal costumes. And then on the far right, you can see a little kid wearing a kind of Japanese style uh, school costume. So it's kind of the beginning of the, the end of, not the end, but the, the, the kind of the decimation of, of uh, Aboriginal cultures, as we, as we used to know. Uh, so the colonial history goes back about 400 years, starting with the Dutch, uh, who were kind of kicked out of uh, Thai, uh, China and set up shop in, in Taiwan. Um, they lasted about 40 years, and then they were, they were kicked out by the invading uh, a, a guy called Guo Xingye, who's a, a military leader under the Ming Dynasty, who, who kicked out the, 
the uh, the Dutch and and set up his own kind of kingdom there for about twenty years until they were they were uh, smashed by the the Qing dynasty and taken over the mainland. Um, and then yeah, after the the invasion of the, uh, of Japan, Japan uh, Taiwan was seceded to Japan, which uh, they had for about fifty years, uh, and that then the the Nationalist Party came over in the fifties. Um, under Dutch rule, I um, wouldn't say it was harmonious, but uh, it wasn't that devastating. There was a lot of trade going on, especially with uh, kind of uh, hides and uh, timber materials. Um, funnily enough, the apart from the fact that they, you know forced kind of education and uh, and evangelization was going on with the Dutch, they they translated the Bible into the original uh, in the Aboriginal language. Uh, which uh, the one that was uh, they were in, in touch with, which was the Sharia language, um, which you can see is the, the, the purple bit in, in, in Tainan. That's where the Sharia tribe are living, and uh, and they translated the Gospel of Matthew and a few other texts into sh Sharia. And after that language died out, that uh, these documents are essentially what has kept the language going. So uh, linguists have been working with that data to reconstruct the languages. And uh, and now, uh, the Shiraya community are making their own resources based upon work that was done 400 years ago, and they started this whole uh, rebirth of, of their language and culture, which is really interesting. Um, that's that's a little uh, well, it's not it's, it's quite a large monument just outside the village I was living in, and uh, you can see a, a Sakizaya warrior <coughs> pointing out across the ocean as the approaching Dutch ship comes uh, into the bay, and that's kind of commemorating the the, uh, the first kind of uh, colonial period. Uh, I don't want to talk about the Ming, because nothing happened. Um, <laughs> Qing, Qing rule, uh, you saw a rise in, in Hokkaido immigrants from Fujian and uh, later the Hakka, which went on to be kind of the two largest languages uh, in on the island, before Mandarin was, was, was taken over, before Mandarin took over. Um, during this time, the Aborigines were classified into what they called the um, the raw savages and the of the mountains and the cooked savages of the plains tribes. And this had to do with the fact that uh, that the the plains tribes uh, were, were living uh, in, in close communication, uh, close contact with the with the Han, and uh, had adopted their language, their customs, their taxation policies, uh, and therefore they were regarded as semi civilized because they had bowed to Qing culture, uh, whereas the, the mountain, mountain tribes refused. Um, this led to the complete linguistic sinicization of the Plains tribes, um, which is now, which is like uh, why they have very few um, rights today in terms of Aboriginal rights. <clears throat> um, under the Japanese, uh, education in, in Japanese language was compulsory. Um, most elderly uh, indigenous people today have a better grasp of Japanese than they do Mandarin. Um, yeah, lo lots of traditional practices like head hunting and tattooing were banned, um, so kind of forcibly removing aspects of culture that was that they considered to be dangerous to their uh, to their uh, colony. Uh, and there were lots of forced resettlements of the of the mountain tribes down to the coastal areas so they could uh, get in and start to mine. And, uh, and cut down trees for timber for the to build up things for the empire. Um, so, so a lot of kind of displacement of Aborigines happened during this time. Um, but it was really under the Republic of China where the really aggressive language uh, policies started to come in. Uh, obviously, you know that uh, Taiwan was under martial law for a very long time, longest in history, I believe. And uh, during this time, there was a. a Initially, it was uh, to get rid of all J kind of Japanese influence, so they wanted to uh, impose a Mandarin language policy across the island, uh, and and this applied heavily to not only the Aboriginal people but also local languages like Hakka and and, and uh, Nani, uh, like uh, Fujian, uh, Hokkien, Taiwanese Hokkien. <coughs> um, during this time, local languages, including Aboriginal languages, were banned in schools uh, and in public. Uh, no media or newspapers of anything other than Mandarin was allowed to be published. Um, there was a widespread con confiscation of Bibles written in Aboriginal languages throughout the 70s as well, so it was very aggressive. 
these are some of the policies that were inflicted. That in 1957, you had the Mandarin promotion groups in the mountains, mountain counties, so they sent people to go and educate uh, people in Mandarin. Uh, you had after-work training programs throughout the 60s, so people would, would come and, and again be forced uh, to learn uh, Han ways and, and Han language. Uh, again, the improving of the improving of the education of Aborigines, all of this is just forced uh, policies. Um, and th this went right up through the 80s until the lift of martial, uh, the lift of martial law in 1987. After that, a variety of um, indigenous movements helped to um, push for Aboriginal rights, land rights, rights to culture and language. <coughs> and uh, which led to a um, the beginning of a, of a, of a essentially, it, it's been a very, although it's been kind of up and down, th there's been a, a definite improvement of Aboriginal uh, language education through since the 90s up to the present day. So, in, in 1990, well, in 1988, actually, the government. Sorry? Oh, sorry, I thought you were asking me that. Um, in 1988, the government uh, proposed the, the first five year plan, uh, and this was, this was implemented at, uh, in 1993. Um, which was uh, a, a project about developing Aboriginal education programs, and they dedicate they, they put forward two hundred thousand NT dollars to to uh, developing Aboriginal um, resources and uh, teacher training. But before that, um, there was a lot of grass mo grassroots movements that were still going on. Um, previously, in nineteen ninety, Atayal was being taught in the Bulai Primary School just outside Taipei. Um, you had um, the legal recognition of developed orthography. So a lot of these were done by Paul Lee, who is a very famous uh, linguist in our circles um, from Academia Sinica. Um, textbooks were designed and compiled uh, in 1994, uh, yeah. and there were incentives like annual awards for excellence in education, so there's like funding would be given for uh, resource development. Um, yeah, institute schools that promoted Aboriginal language learning was subsidized, so they had like tax cuts and things like that. Um, and then it wasn't until yeah the second second five year project, but it, it wasn't until two thousand and one that Aboriginal languages were actually implemented into the national curriculum uh, on a um, a compulsory level. Um, well, local languages that included Aboriginal languages, and this is uh, from the uh, elementary through to junior high school. So it didn't necessarily mean that you had to study Amis, but you had to pick a local language, be it uh, Hakka or, or Hokkien or, or an Aboriginal language, if it was, if you could get access to a teacher, and that was a real problem as well. <clears throat> so the present, it's not that bad. Actually, the, the kids, the kids, well, some of the kids, maybe even Aboriginal language classes are actually quite, quite, quite fun. Uh, so the key points of discussion I want to focus on are uh, participate, participation, and decision making of. of um, of resource development and teaching, um, the kinds of teaching training that was available, um, pedagogy and methodology that's being used, curriculum design or lack of curriculum design, uh, <laughs> lack of materials, and then how these things are not assessed. So all of these are negative, <laughs> but necessary. Okay. So the government, although it's easy to criticize, they have. Um, I think the was it the Council of Indigenous Peoples, which is like a, a, a um, the indigenous branch of the government, was was set up in 1996 to deal with Aboriginal affairs, and they've been um, uh, very uh, instrumental in, in driving uh, indigenous education development, um, both through funding and through um, their ties to universities and to uh, and through local local government uh, to working with public schools. Um, so they've been donating a lot of money over, I mean, for example, yeah, I said 200,000 NT for the first five-year project. Um, other institutions like Chunchi University, Academia Sinica, have been working with communities to develop resources, doing linguistic analysis, um, editing of textbooks. Uh, the teaching college, at Ma uh, it was called the Teachers College of Hualien, now it's part of National Donghua University. Um, they set up um, courses to teach uh, Aboriginal uh, speakers, uh, speakers of Aboriginal languages, how to teach um, and to help develop uh, resources. Um, and then some more local uh, governments like Tainan City Count, uh, County Council have been working with the Shiraya to, um, to fund 
they're like it's, it's a small community of people that have been developing their own resources, and that because they're not recognised by the national government, they're not given any money, but they are given money by the by the local government, who also I think they see it as kind of a tourist attraction as well. Um, but they've done things like they've, they've, they've started teaching Sharia in elementary schools and um, and even having it broadcast on, on local buses, which is pretty cool. I'm going to have that like last year. Uh, alongside this, there's uh, grassroots movements. This can't really be emphasized enough, the importance of this. So um, most local schools and teachers develop their own resources, DVDs, textbooks, materials, music, um, dances, everything. Um, some villagers got together and had research and editing groups where they would regularly try to see, um, they would assess uh, their, what materials were there and then try to kind of um, develop them and, make the, and improve on them. Uh, the Shiraya have been working recently with their building, compiling their own dictionaries and ebooks with almost no government support. Um, recently, uh, volunteers have, have developed an app which you can download on your phone called the Moedict Amis Dictionary app. Um, it's mainly a, uh, it's a digi digitized version of an earlier publication, but uh, still, it's pretty cool to play around with. Uh, and parent and community involvement have been really key in driving this. And I'd like to play you a, a short video, um, just to show you kind of the, how, uh, is there sound on this? Yeah, yeah sure. There Good. Is. Uh, to show you the kind of, uh, how, how communities are getting involved in, in, in education. <laughs> Taidong's 4i elementary school on their weekly mother language day. On this day, all students have to wear traditional army accessories. The indigenous language teachers say language and culture go hand in hand. In order to learn a language, students must first identify themselves with the culture. That's why the school has partnered with the community and invited local elders to teach army lessons. <laughs> Other schools are now following for a successful program. They too are attempting to create a language and cultural environment. Boai has managed to keep its Amis program for six years. The secret of their success is the support of community elders. How do we make it work? Our elders have really contributed a lot. The locals understand that our school is trying so hard to promote such lessons. So they offer us support and help with the promotion. The school has only 21 students, mostly Amis. The school's Amis lessons are so interesting that even the only non-indigenous student said she was happy to be submerged in the language learning environment. I kind of like it, because sometimes we are learning other languages. We speak the indigenous language here. We speak the Amis language. They don't reject it. They even like learning it with me. However, the school was the only place they provided an indigenous language environment at the beginning. The language teachers say when they first started the lessons, many parents still spoke Mandarin with their children. The school had to spend time communicating with the parents to win their support. It was hard enough to teach the language at school, but at home, some parents used giant erasers to wipe out our efforts. After the children return home, their family members still use Mandarin for communication. So at every parents' meeting, we have to tell the elders again and again the indigenous languages were getting popular, that it was not like before when students were punished for speaking an indigenous language. The teaching program covers six topics, including community field studies, oral history on Amis, an overview of the Amis group and traditional arts and crafts. The project has drawn the school and locals closer. Community members have recognized the school's effort in promoting the Amis culture. Now many students are also enforcing their language skills at home. We support the school because the community and school are working together. We support their teaching program. Sometimes my dad told me to fetch something and I didn't understand. He would question me why I didn't learn our mother language well. Then I reply, oh, so when I have some free time at home, I will take out the language book and study it. Boai 
Elementary School has successfully created an Amis language learning environment. The lessons cover not only language, but also history and all the cultural aspects of the Amis group. The program has won support of the parents. The students say they identify with the Amis culture and they must be able to speak their own language. TITV Weekly. Well, that was nice. I should have got a longer one and just walked out. <laughs> but uh, yeah, so uh, a lot of the uh, the elders of the communities have been are, are called in to, to step in as teachers. Even a lot of them, even if they're not qualified to teach, really. at least that was the case at the beginning. Still is, as I've as I've seen myself. Um, a lot of this is was also to do with the lack of uh, appropriate teacher training that's that's available. So when it was first opened up, the, the training program was 72 hours long. Um, I'm now in my, what, how long have I been teaching? Since October. Uh, and I'm still rubbish. <laughs> and I teach, I teach every day in, in secondary schools. In Croydon and, and, and hybridism, it's hard to teach. It's really hard. <laughs> and uh, 72 two hours is nothing. It's absolutely nothing. Uh, so they introduced a shorter course <laughs> of 36 hours for the general public. So most of the graduates who, who went through this course uh, were not accepted to teach in schools. Uh, some of it, was, some of the reasons included that they didn't speak the language fluently, um, or that the, just the training wasn't good enough. Right, uh, the pedagogy wasn't wasn't there, um, and they were yeah unsatisfactory and inconsistent teaching methods. Uh, and also, most 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 teachers don't go on to uh, continue their learning. They don't go on to they're on kind of continuous uh, training programs, at least until recently. So, National Donghua University is now uh, offering a new curriculum developed by Indigenous teachers to help other Indigenous language teachers to advance their uh, studies and their teaching skills. So, hopefully, things will get better in the future. This was this is actually a, a, a quote from Tsang La Hoi interviewed, uh, and she said. I only attended the 36-hour uh, tribal university course, and after passing the Indigenous Language Proficiency Test, I took the 36-hour course commissioned by the, C the Council of Indigenous Peoples and Taiwan Normal University. I've forgotten almost all of the teaching methods taught by the teachers during the course, and it didn't leave an impression on me, which is great. <laughs> the teaching methods I adopted today are copied from the English language teaching videos and the music, Chinese language, nature, arts, and humanities curriculums, and teaching materials from National Donghua University's elementary education teachers train of tra training program. I think about what kinds of methods and resources I would like to use as if I were learning the language myself. So it's very kind of, um, she's really invested in teaching, and she's a good teacher, but she does off her own back. So this, this is just something that she's had to do herself. Resources. So I've actually got some resources here that I'd like to hand around and show you. Um, so many of the materials here uh, are limited in uh, in that they, they include the phonetic symbols. So a lot of it is about just kind of speaking uh, how to make how to make the correct sound in the language, which is uh, really a huge focus, and they don't really get past that. So the kids can can say like you know cow, fantastically, but they can't really make a sentence. Um, uh, they have some, some vocab items and pronunciation drills. A lot of them have typos and errors uh, and issues with orthography development, so inconsistencies with orthography as well. Um, the books didn't increase in difficulty in an appropriate way. There's no scaffolding, as we call it, in the trade of teaching. Things are not appropriately scaffolded. Uh, and because a lot of them were based on existing um, resources, uh, there was a lot of Chinese influence because they were using Chinese style books to kind of model themselves on. So um, there wasn't enough Aboriginal input into the design. Uh, yeah, so I'll hand, you, I'll hand you through it. So this one, this was actually developed by uh, a Sakizaya teacher. It's just, a, it's just a vocab list, simple vocab list. But this is like, this is really useful. Um, these, these are the things that have been developed by the Council of Indigenous Peoples, um, which I'll, I'll show some examples of. Um, We've got a storybook, a little picture storybook in Sakizaya. Again, the orthography is not the one they use now, but uh, it's still the one that's in common use, even downloadable from online. And this, this is a, a kind of a linguistic grammar book on Sakizaya, which 
uh, is useful for uh, linguists, but not very much for <laughs> anyone, anyone else. So I have a little look through those and pass them around uh, while I'm carrying on. Okay. And this is an example of uh, this found in one of the books, I believe, in there. So this is, this is just a, a typical story. Um, Kamun Babalati, which is the, the words of the elders, so a lot of it's kind of con uh, con culturally contextual. Um, there's no O in the Sakizaya uh, orthography anymore. Um, it's been all replaced by U. But when you download the books, uh, you have uh, you have this one. This this is actually copied from the Amis, uh, which is a related language. You're, I mean, this is your typical layout. So you have you have a, you have a, a, a story or maybe a little dialogue. You have uh, a vocab list, um, and you have some questions. So, like the first one is like, what what does what noise does the frog make when it's when it rains? Uh, and then you <laughs> you answer the questions based on. But it's not. It doesn't explain how to make those sentences. Uh, you have um, you have kind of a kind of a, a word by word breakdown later on, but they're wrong. So, for example, uh, in the first line where it says sa, that is not the verb to be. It's an evidential marker. They don't actually have a verb to be. Um, so it's kind of like. It, if you're learning a language and, and you and you turn to that, and you'll think, oh, okay, sa is just you know it's a verb and it's but it, it doesn't work like that. So the, the, actually, the breakdown of the structure is 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 not correct, and it doesn't really give you any indication on how the words are constructed morphologically, which are, is really important actually in a language like this. Um, so when the languages were kind of added into the national curriculum. Um, they're only compulsory until elementary and junior high, as I said. Uh, there are lots of problems with this. One, school teachers are not employed uh, full time. So most teachers travel between anything up to five to 10 schools and, and teach a variety of classes across, depending on how many schools need them. Um, there's no official scheme of work. So the teacher plans uh, lessons according to the needs of the student and not to any kind of specified um, what well, scheme, topic scheme, which, which you would expect in say like a GCSE level French or something like that. Um, most schools set their own kind of curricula. It's really up to the individual teacher. And the curriculum is generally based on the content needed to pass the Aboriginal language proficiency test, which is funded and uh, assessed by the Council of Indigenous Peoples. This is a it's 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 almost like a GCSE, but not because it's not. Well, I say GCSE uh, for comparison, but it's it's not uh, equivalent and um, or valued in the same way. Um, a lot of the this is the main drive for people to study is to pass the test. Why? Because it gives you this thing called the extra score policy. It gives you thirty five percent. If you pass the test, you get thirty five percent knocked off or added, should I say, to your. Um, your end of uh, your high school exams. Um, so when you go on to uh, apply for university, they'll add 35% onto your grade, which means you don't have to do so well in your other subjects in order to get the same grade as somebody got higher scores. Um, there are also scholarships uh, for winners of tribal language competitions. So the reason that they do this is to try to promote uh, fairness. So people, Aborigines who are heavily so socially and economically marginalized um, it's kind of an incentive for them to learn to get the additional support that they wouldn't otherwise have. Um, there, are, there are a bunch of uh, problems with this. Is, uh, there are only a certain amount of scholarships per school. Um, so uh, they, they can't offer it to everybody who passes, passes the test. Uh, it's not valued as a qualification in the same way as others, mainly because it's not, uh, it's not really applicable afterwards. If you have a degree in English, you can go on to do business. If you have a degree in Amis, or a qualification in Amis, can't really do much with it yet, okay? which is what I want to talk about. Um, there's a standardization and homogenization of sort of, uh, certain dialects. So for example, Sakizaya, they have one kind of thing for Sakizaya, but actually there are at least two different dialects, a northern and a southern one. Pronunciation is quite different. Uh, if, you, if you read one in, in the standard orthography, 
and then you you learn like I did the northern dialect, you read it and it's, you wouldn't say it in the same way at all. So it was like, oh. Um, so there's this kind of like, the, it's not, it doesn't pay attention to the, the dialectal uh, continuum. Um, and students from mixed backgrounds uh, or more affluent urban areas can take the place of rural Aborigines who might need the scholarship more. So, I mean, I was talking to Muni about this, actually, she, she, she's helped me out with this. Um, if, if, um, if, you're, if your father is, say, Amisa and your mother is Han Chinese, you can, you can still have like an Aboriginal uh, card, identity card, uh, as well as a Han one. So, if you, so you can use either one for your exam. Say, I, so say uh, I'm, I'm, I'm you know, pretty good, life's good for me, and then this kid who lives over here in this village, life's not so great for her. Uh, we both apply to this school. We both get, uh, only one of us can get accepted. Um, you know, it, 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 so the, the, there is a degree of unfairness there. It's uh, still not really um, uh, addressed. Uh, this is this is a sample from the um, <laughs> from the the Sakizaya, all my examples of the Sakizaya because I, I understand them <laughs> more. Or less. Um, uh, so this is this is uh, the first one's like a a reading comprehension, and then you have a listening tests where they would ask you something, and you have to answer the question based on. Um, so yeah, it's uh, so this is just a practice test that you can do online to prepare for the proficiency exam. But that's the kind of standard testing of the four skills. Um, because the courses are elective, especially well, I mean, in in kind of uh, high school, uh, the non-national standards need to be met by the school. So say like if, if everybody fails uh, maths. Um, in a school, there'll be like a serious investigation as to why the school is doing so badly. Uh, if everyone fails a miss, it doesn't really matter. Plus, only about two or three kids may have taken the exam. So then there's no assessment and there's no um, evaluation of teaching standards, and that's not fed back into the system. It's just kind of for up. Um, also, because <laughs> if you have a bad teacher and you get rid of it, where are you going to get the next one? <laughs> um, so schools are not held to account in the same way uh, as other subjects and therefore the assessment doesn't impact the quality of teaching. So schools have taken it upon themselves to actually assess. So they take turns in hosting speaking, listening, and vocab tests um, to test, to kind of compete against each other, which spurs on this, this desire to, to do well. Um, so again, this is kind of like a grassroots thing coming in there to replace uh, or, or to, to, to fill the, the, the space where the um, authority should be, should be taking um, some kind of control. So yeah, this is my friend Sangla. She's uh, she's half Amis, half Sakizaya. Uh, she she only did the thirty six hour training program, and then an additional one after that actually. Uh, and she's currently, I think, she just finished her masters in education at National Bangkok University. So she's carried on her her teaching, which is why she's a good teacher. But she currently teaches thirty uh, sessions per week across eight different schools. Uh, so she's always traveling around, always in her car. Difficult to get hold of. Uh, she teaches in six primary schools, one middle school and one high school. So that kind of shows you the drop-off rate. So you might get like a bunch of kids well, who happen to take it in primary. But as soon as they reach junior high and middle school, where it becomes optional to drop it. Mainly because of the pressures to do well in English and Mandarin uh, outweigh you know, the additional stress of having to do an indigenous language work. So she focuses on uh, four different kinds of methods for her teaching. She has uh, the situational language teaching, the audio lingual method, total physical response, uh, and the direct method. So situ situational language teaching is about emphasizing the use of real language situations. Um, so things like, you know, um, instead of just learning grammar, it's about how to talk to members of the family, how to greet people, how to buy things, how to uh, talk about cultural festivals, uh, situations where you would use uh, Aboriginal language. Um, languages. <laughs> um, so all of these, there are dialogues that are modeled by the teacher. So like, hello, you know, how are you, mother? Oh, I'm fine, da da da. Uh, and then the class will drill it until the sentence patterns become familiar. Um, and then, and then they can be revised by the textbooks that you're all holding. So this is kind of like your standard. Um, so the idea is to kind of recreate this, uh, this kind of real life uh, situations. 
the audiolingual method emphasizes uh, natural language habits and use of imitation, memorization, and repetition. So this is about listening and speaking. So this is this is very. Um, um, it's, it's it's not it's not. All of this feeds into the fact that that ab to ever, Aboriginal languages are traditionally oral languages. They're not written down, and therefore there's no need to to study the grammar in the same. Well, there's not a need. There is a need, but there's no. Uh, that's not that's not the way they've traditionally been taught. Yeah, they've been learned by listening and, and speaking. Um, so you have this kind of repetition of sentence patterns. So um, Sangla might first uh, give. Um, do a, a kind of a, a dialogue, and then she'll explain it kind of line by line, the gist maybe of, of, of or the gist of the dialogue, um, and then she will she'll get the kids to repeat, and then to come up and to, to do the dialogue themselves to act it out. Okay, so it's very kind of hands on, uh, and then but but it won't be it won't be a lot. There'll be like a few key sentences that will be repeated. Once they become familiar, uh, once the the the, mod, the structures of these sentences are familiar. They'll be, they'll be assessed um, through uh, words, uh, what's the word? <laughs> substitution, word sub substitution. So for example, this would be like, uh, so father goes to the mountains to hunt, and then they might uh, change uh, father, ama, with baki, grandpa goes to the mountains to hunt, right? So she would, first they would learn the thing, and then she'd say, okay, so if, if talalutuk chiyama amiyatuk means father goes to the thing and you know all the words, what? how would you say grandpa goes to the, and they would go, oh, okay, and then they just replace the word, right? So then they can get, it's kind of like this inductive learning approach, right? And then they might say, so how would you say father goes to the mountain to do something else instead of hunting? How would you stick a verb on the end? So then they would change it. So this word substitution, you can, with one simple thing, you can then start to build up uh, quite complex sentences, or at least at least uh, different sentences with the same structure. So the total physical response method, this is kind of, I don't know how popular this is, but it's pretty good, especially for, for beginning uh, language learning and for kids. That's where, for example, I might say to you all, uh, and everybody would, and I, and I would, I would model, right? And I would sit down and then, so I, I would model and say in Chinese, and then I would, I would ask you to, to do the same thing. But then eventually I would just, I wouldn't model, I would just say the words and you would repeat it. And then I would ask you to do the same, to, to, to repeat it and to do the action. So this is, this is what they call total physical response. Um, it's good to do things like <coughs> verbs and commands, things that you can just gesture, but it's difficult to do it with abstract concepts, obviously, and uh, animals. I mean, you could, you could make a noise of an animal. If you, but how would you do fish? I don't know. <laughs> but, um, uh, so th this is on kind of passive skills, um, listening and understanding, and not necessarily reading, writing, things like that, or speaking. Uh, and then there's the direct method, which is, um, so th this is about kind of the use of target language, where target language is only used in the class. There's no grammar, there's no explanations, there's no translations, it's just me speaking language to you all the time. <clears throat> and this is hard, and some people don't like this method. I don't like the method, um, but because I think it's important to explain grammatical concepts to the kids, at least in my school. That's not necessarily the way people like to be taught. And again, we're, we're going to talk about that as well, if we've got time. <laughs> I could like move on. Um, yeah, so this is a typical language class, she's got like two kids. Oh. Yeah, I've been to her classes, there's not many students. Um, this, this is just something that she said. So she said, the students only have 40 minutes a week, 40 minutes to an hour a week of classes to, to become fluent in whatever, whatever Aboriginal language they're studying, okay? Um, there's not much opportunity for them to speak in daily life, and so she uses the time to practice speaking. So this is the focus of her classes. I hope my students will speak, listen, and read aloud. So it's, it's not about reading, writing, essays, things like that. It's about communication. My method is first at the start of the lesson, I get my students to take turns to come to the front of the class and greet everyone in the language, introduce themselves, like my name is, and then they count from 1 to 90. I don't know, they might take turns, because I think if you just got one kid to count to 90 and sit down and get another kid to count to 90, maybe I'll do 1 to 10, they'll do 11 to 20. Um, so the front one leads, and, um, and they go around until everyone's done, and then they start the new content. The class. So she'll use this kind of, it's called Yen Yi Le Yen, which is a, a website for um, 
uh, for materials, um, for support materials for the for the um, proficiency test. Um, a lot of it's kind of pictorial and they have things like that. So uh, she'll use uh, pictures for learning and build individual words, so visual prompts, um, and then they'll 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 practice that with some key phrases, um, and then sometimes she'll let the kid. This is this is good. This kind of like the the student teacher. She'll let the kid come and lead the class while she goes around and checks pronunciations. So get, getting the kids to feel that uh, they have some kind of agency of their learning and they can, you know, it makes them feel good that they can actually teach. Um, again, just, just getting the kids to become involved. This is uh, just some drawings and pictures related to the vocabulary that they're learning. Um, pretty good. I think the right's just colored in. The other one on the left looks drawn, so yeah. Um, so these are a couple of problems that uh, she has in her classes. One is mixed Aboriginal classes, uh, in that if you don't have enough teachers for all the different Aboriginal kids in your class, what do you do, right? So she said, six years ago I was teaching at a primary school, they couldn't find anyone to teach Banun. Uh, and so they lumped all the Banun kids into her Ami's class. And Banun and Ami's aren't related at all, those languages, they're completely mutually in. <laughs> And unintelligible and culturally very, very different. Uh, so there's no reason for a person to learn Amis. They may as well learn anything else, but you know, there's no link to their culture. Um, so they were all there learning Amis. Uh, and then she had a Sakizaya student. Her, uh, his teacher, unfortunately, was ill. Um, and so he sat in her class, and she would teach uh, her students in Amis, and then set them on task, and then she'd go over and, uh, and help him individually with his work. Luckily, kind of Amis and Sakizai are quite similar, so uh, if they paid attention to the grammar, if there is any that she'll teach, then it uh, could, 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 uh, could work. Uh, she has a lot of lack of resources. She says, for most of my teaching, it's necessary to utilize online resources. The textbooks produced uh, by the CIP um, have been put on the website. Um, because schools have no, way, no funding to provide the teaching materials, I just have one textbook, and the content's really basic, which you can see, uh, and therefore desperately need of other teaching materials. Um, so outside of language learning, there's other things that they can do. There's community involvement, the speech, singing, and dance competitions to make it interactive, uh, weekend language lessons, um, mostly done with elders, and this, they, they started this thing called family training, which is, I don't know if you've ever heard about the Master Apprentice programs in America, uh, where you have, uh, for native language learning, you have like a young guy who basically just kind of uh, hangs around with an older guy who only speaks to him in native languages uh, and they do things together like cooking and gardening and, and so they learn by just spending time with and, and that's actually funded by the government uh, the local government so they're paid almost like as, as employers to learn a language and then to go on to become teachers um, so th this is this is one of the weekend classrooms this is um, one of the elders Juan Jim one this he built this kind of classroom onto the side of his house uh, and he teaches kids uh, at the weekends, and does. And he was one of my language consultants for my for my PhD as well. I was working with him closely on traditional stories in that in that very room, getting bitten by Shell Haywin, which were like little mosquito <laughs> things. But, uh, uh, but one of the one of the biggest problems facing um, Aboriginal language learning is are not necessarily resources or teachers, but uh, urban migration. So this started off in the 70s with national infrastructure projects. You had a lot of uh, Aborigines moving to the cities to do manual labor work. Um, if you look at the map, you can see all of the um, industry uh, and urbanization is developed along the west coast, and almost nothing in the mountain ranges in the north and the coastal region on the, on the east coast, uh, which is a blessing and a curse. It's, it's a blessing because most of the Aboriginal, the Aboriginal culture has survived, languages has survived in this place because they've been relatively isolated. And it's a curse because there's no development there, there's no jobs, there's high unemployment, um, and a host of um, socioeconomic problems relating to that, including there are huge, uh, very high rates of alcoholism, domestic abuse, um, depression, suicide. I mean, it, but this, this is, this is the, the case across all Aboriginal um, communities in Canada, Australia as well. Um, so current estimates, if you look at, I should have translated that into English, it doesn't matter. Um, of the 560,000 Aborigines in Taiwan today, about uh, 263,000 or just under 50% live in urban areas now. Okay, 
So while we've got all this lovely community development and the elders working with the things, that's not actually the case for half the population. Okay? So you've got a lot of kids growing up in urban areas where they come from disadvantaged backgrounds, which I've just mentioned. <sighs> Migrant families are typically of lower economic status than Han Chinese, and therefore they're viewed as second-class citizens. Uh, there's a lack of cultural awareness in urban areas. There's institutionalized racism for both teachers and students, whether or not they acknowledge it. Uh, cultural and linguistic isolation, so there's no support network for urban indigenous people, um, which ultimately leads to low self-esteem and a rejection of Aboriginal heritage with a desire just to fit in. Okay, so Cheng and Jacob interviewed 12 different students in Taipei and found the following. Most had never, re or some had never returned to their villages to experience tribal life. Uh, so they had no idea about the context in which their language is, is, is spoken. Um, most students need to learn at least four languages, Mandarin, English, Taiwanese, Hokkien, and then their language, their tribal language. So there are kind of priorities, right? What do you prioritize? Mandarin in English, which will give you uh, good socioeconomic opportunities, or your tribal language, which gives you that kind of cultural contact, but then gives you no jobs afterwards. So it's a real issue for them. Um, the national curriculum has almost no information on indigenous cultures, uh, or their values, or their perceptions, or their histories. Um, as a result, both teachers and students lack cultural awareness and have these long-held stereotypes uh, and prejudice. <clears throat> so this is, this is yeah, when we talk about the 35% the, the of the score policy, a lot of Han students feel that this is unfair. Um, and some of them have been o overtly racist to their Aboriginal classmates. So this is a quote from a, uh, a girl in grade 10. Says my elementary school peers would frequently run around my table and yell, "I'm not going to do it," but do the, you know, uh, like American Indians. Okay. So, Cho wrote his uh, PhD dissertation on language on, on teaching attitudes in, in urban areas, and he found that Han Chinese teachers overwhelmingly had these kind of culture blind perspectives and and uh, didn't acknowledge that there was any racism happening in schools at all. Um, they believe that. All students should be treated the same, regardless, there should be no differentiation, there should be no allowances. Um, if you fail, it's your fault. You didn't work hard enough. Uh, and uh, indigenous cultures were taught from a very, a very um, tourist kind of perspective. Um, there was no depth to what they said. Indigenous teachers, on the other hand, <clears throat> uh, they reflected the importance of promoting uh, cultural diversity diversity and challenging social discrimination where they found it. Um, they demonstrated a sense of agency and desire to make a change for the students in city schools. They often acted as surrogate parents uh, for the children, so if the children had issues that they wanted to talk about, they would come to the teachers who would understand the kind of problems that they were going through. Um, and they were able to make a difference through connections with churches, uh, social networks, and their common culture and experiences. And this is something that I want to talk about, um, which is the different modes of learning. And this is something which isn't really discussed a huge amount, but it's about um, uh, how indigenous peoples across the globe tend to have, or not tend to, but there, there, there can be um, different, different modes of learning. People learn differently. Like uh, we all know that the Asian, kind of Japanese, Korean method is rote learning, repetition, Drilling. This is like they've become famous for that kind of mode of learning. Um, it wouldn't work over here. There'd be a rebellion. There'd be a. Re I know it. My kids. Would, my kids would literally hang me if I uh, if I if I had this mode of learning. We have to adapt to the cultures in which we we find ourselves. Um, people learn differently. Um, so um, indigenous styles across the, the board in, in, in previous studies have shown that uh, they, they tend to favor things like observation, imitation, narratives and storytelling, collaboration and cooperation. And in their paper, Indigenous, Indigenous Elementary Students Science Instruction in Taiwan, Indigenous Knowledge and Western Science, that's a nice paper, uh, Lee uh, notes that uh, Indigenous students have to learn uh, subjects in the Han environment, whether it be brought up in another language with different modes of learning, uh, and different cultural values. But they found that by incorporating indigenous knowledge into their lessons, um, they, they helped to, it didn't only, it not only helped to scaffold their learning, um, but it also helped them to have a, a, a 
an increased sense of pride in their own culture and identity. So they did. They were, they were learning a. They did a program about time, and they introduced like a um, the the Amis concept of traditional concept of, of how time works, and then compared it to kind of the Western concept. And and that was uh, that was fascinating for people to see that you, that you can perceive things like time in, in different ways, and they're not necessarily rubbish. You know. They're, they're There's value to these things. Um, yeah, and, and other studies by Lynn has shown that uh, that they're, they're kind of collaborative. Learn, that, that students uh, tend to learn uh, visually and kinesthetically, and they prefer collaborative learning based on group solving um, because their knowledge is traditionally acquired through participating in hunting, obs observation, storytelling, uh, group late in group related activities, and not by mainstream textbooks and examinations. So this, this is something that if you don't fit into the kind of the hand system, you're stupid. When really it's just that you don't learn that way. And it's as simple as that. That's why you have things like Duolingo. is Because you know, people learn different way. We know this here, but it hasn't been accepted in Taiwan. Now one great way to kind of overcome this barrier is by the use of online technology, which is why I mentioned Duolingo. So online educational resources include things like dictionaries, e-books, archives and recordings, indigenous media, film, music, art, and games and activities. Taiwan has the largest number of digital households in the world, apparently. Most people have, even, even elderly people, have uh, an iPhone or some, some kind of smartphone that they walk around on. Um, and, uh, and, and some studies, some developments of, of e-learning uh, software developed in, 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 in Orchid Island uh, has showed that uh, indigenous communities actually not only value but find it quite effective to have good, high-quality resources uh, that they can access on their phones, now, and I'll talk about that in a sec. So the impact of technology, multimedia content gives you different modes of learning, audio, visual, games, substitution methods, you can have anything on a phone. It's easily accessible and affordable, most of these things are downloadable for free. Um, autonomous content development, so people like this Shiraya have, have, have set up a website where they digitize all the materials, uh, and they've done it for very little money because they use software which is free and available to use. Um, so th th that kind of gives you this sense of um, again grassroots. You can you can um, you can empower indigenous communities through through technology if they have access to it, of course. Uh, independent distance learning, which is good for urban urban populations. So things like if you if you have uh, you can have indigenous Skype lessons if you don't have access to a native speaker. Uh, creates new fo new forms for language use. People are using indigenous languages on Facebook, on Twitter. It modernizes traditional languages. This is kind of I don't like this, but uh, but this is something that keeps coming up. I think you know, in increasing the kind of the the the, um, the the area for use. I like that more than just modernizing, but uh, also kind of new word, new word development, you know, things like that. Uh, creating a strong online presence for Aborigines, so they can kind of. Uh, I mean, we're all about kind of curating ourselves on Facebook, right? So like we we know that you can you can you can. I don't do it, but. <laughs> be used as like sneering, but uh, the idea of um, of being able to portray yourself on your own terms is very important. Yeah, instead of being viewed through whatever the media, uh, and yeah, and, and using social media to to establish or re-establish connections between urban youth and tribal villages. This is an example of a um, a group uh, for the for the the Sakizai village I was living in. Two of them actually. Um, so people who, who lead the village can kind of keep in touch with their friends and families in, in the local village. Um, and this has been, been really good. Uh, this is a, a digital, um, a digitized version of all 16 languages, the, the, the dictionaries, um, that have been done by the, the, the CIP. Um, it's a really, really, that, that, uh, that helped me out a lot in my PhD. <laughs> I didn't know any words. And I, couldn't, I didn't have access to a speaker either, and I was just like, oh, dictionary. Um, so again, the, the, but they're, they're quite limited, but they're, they're good. Um, this is a, a really good website. Um, th this is, this is the, the stuff for the, 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 the support materials for the proficiency test. It's got a lot of recordings. It's thematic. Uh, again, it doesn't have like a, a morphological breakdown, which is really necessary, but nonetheless, it's, uh, it's useful. These are ebooks. Um, I've, I've highlighted those because you can see that you have some, like the Rukai here, you have 42 books available. 
and then the the Thao, the the, the uh, Seisha, uh, you have like seven books. So so that is the unequal kind of development there. Um, Taiwanese Indigenous Television was founded in 2005. They do regular uh, broadcasts in, in Indigenous languages, and they update pretty much all their videos onto YouTube, which is really, really useful to get uh, little clips. A lot of them are kind of just uh, a few minutes long, or some of them you get like an hour on there, just an hour broadcast in Sakizaya, which is great, um, with subtitles in Chinese most of the time. Um, they started this thing, they're not, it's called a, a, a mu yu chao, like a, a mother tongue nest or a language nest, but it's not. Uh, it's mainly just two hours of classes that happen uh, a weekend. So you have this, this is in Taipei, so you have a map of Taipei with um, these little um, icons that you click on. You can select, in the yellow, the yellow box there, you can select which language that you're looking for, and, uh, and then it'll come up with a little thing, and, and you can click on it and it'll give you uh, the address of the place, what time, so this one here is an Amish language class with that address, and um, and it's on Sundays at 10 in the morning till 12, so you can go there and practice your Amish learning, language language practice within the city, which is really useful. Um, they also established its uh, University of Taipei Indigenous Community, so this is like a center of learning uh, in the city, so this is about uh, in indigenous skills. Uh, Modern knowledge of indigenous tribal communities, kind of more kind of like publicity for um, for kind of cultural intercultural understanding, lifelong learning. Um, yeah, I mean, th this is something I'll talk about, which kind of like an Aboriginal education system, so kind of integrating uh, Aboriginal concepts and knowledge into the curriculum. Uh, opportunities to participate in tribal culture for urban Aborigines. Um, and co co cooperative learning between the Han Chinese cultures and, and the indigenous population. So the future. I'll be quick. How long do I have? No, I've already run over. Doesn't matter. Are you enjoying it? Yeah. Then I'll keep going. <laughs> this is a good part. Okay. So uh, now we have an increased status of Aboriginal languages. Um, this is like a, a nice political thing um, that just came up last year, which I'll talk about. Uh, there needs to be increased motivation to new job opportunities, and this is something that, uh, again, is, it's a big ask, but it's, it's a necessary one. Language nests, indigenous language nannies, improved learning resources, cultural education of urban teachers, Aboriginal curriculums, virtual learning environments. Yeah, that's the future. So, we had, we had the famous apology from President Tsai, Tsai Ing-wen, and she said that she apologized to the Aborigines for the historical mistreatment for the first time in their history in 2016, which is long overdue. Um, last uh, May, they granted uh, official status to indigenous languages, which was a huge, huge step. Uh, part of the act uh, that related to you know, education is to, uh, the government should promote Aboriginal languages, compile dictionaries and archives. Uh, government institutions and schools and companies in Aboriginal areas should prepare official documents in local languages. Public transport should use local languages and announcements. They do this on the train if you're going to Kuali and as you pull into Kuali and we have the, the Nami's announcement. The first time I heard that, I got super excited. And uh, uh, all public schools that follow the national curriculum have to provide Aboriginal language courses up to high school now, at least local languages. So, you know. Uh, you can decide not to take it, you can do Hakka or something instead, but you, you have to do a local language up to high school. Um, local education um, should get launched programs to train full-time Aboriginal language teachers, so hopefully more employment opportunities for people to be a teacher full-time in a school instead of having to run around uh, God knows where. Uh, Aboriginal language publications, and airtime for Aboriginal language content in government-owned or government-invested media should not be less than 50%, which is pretty good. Language nests. Uh, this, uh, so a language nest is, uh, is where you have, it's like a nursery where kids are dropped off and they're, uh, they're looked after by um, elderly fluent speakers of the language, usually elderly fluent speakers of the language, um, and they're only spoken to in the target language. 
And uh, this started off in Hawaii and, and New Zealand, and it was trialed in Taipei in 2001, but now there's been kind of a, a, a new uh, resurgence of this. There's 35 kindergartens and 10 nurseries now in the program. Uh, most of the speakers did the, the 36 hours training, so they should be fine. And, uh, but, but again, some studies have shown that uh, this isn't necessarily applicable everywhere. It worked in Hawaii, but it didn't work on mainland, uh, in mainland America for certain reasons, because the situations were different. Uh, and that's something that's been pointed out. So it's not ideal because of the number of children not living in, in, in rural communities where they can be looked after by elderly people. They're all living in the urban areas. Um, but some have started uh, in, in kindergarten as well. They've started this program uh, called Indigenous Language Nannies, which is great. So this is, this is um, you have people who, they have to take, they have, have, this is brand new, this, this, this is this month it started. So the candidate uh, has to do an oral test to see if, you know, if they have uh, good enough uh, language ability. Those who pass then go on to take a 12 hour long nursery training program uh, to look after kids. Um, and then they can apply for uh, grants. Uh, the oral exam was, took place nine days ago. Uh, so they're going through the process now. So this is, this is brand new. Uh, those who, you can either work as like a relative nanny, so looking after kind of like relations, or general nanny, so you can kind of be hired out uh, as to look after other kids. Uh, to do that, you have to go through a 126 hour training certificate, which is <laughs> more than it takes to be a teacher. Um, and uh, yeah, and you, and you get a certain amount of money for each kid that you take on to look after. Um, I don't have time to show that video. <laughs> but it was a nice video about a little kid. I'll show you two seconds. <laughs> It's a minute, we can watch it. Okay. <laughs> Three-year-old Garo spontaneously speaks to his father Mayao in Amis language. Garo lives with his current parents who always take him with them to work on the farm. This has allowed Garo to easily blend into indigenous life. His grandmother says it is only natural that Gado gets to know more on his vocabulary and speak the language well. <laughs> Gado's father Maya is a drift to artist. He does intentionally train the boy to speak the indigenous language. <laughs> The greater loss of languages has been a major concern of the indigenous people. Many local children nowadays can't speak their own languages. But from Garo, we can see that family is an important link to learning indigenous languages in a natural way. So that just goes to show uh, the impact that uh, spending time with native speakers on a regular basis can have for uh, language learning. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, it's not the case in urban areas. Um, this, is the need, this is why there's a, an increasing need in urban centers for self-study. And by that I mean properly scaffolded lessons with dialogue, vocabulary lists, grammar explanations, please, and activities to practice the four skills. Uh, the material should also be culturally rich and contextual uh, and contain, ideally, multimedia. So this is a really nice example from the Yami project. Oh, I, well, this is, well, not this. <laughs> this is Mongolian. And uh, this is just to show you that this is very simple. This is like a kind of a, a regular teach yourself book that we all, we probably all own something. Uh, teach yourself whatever, Spanish. You have your dialogue with, uh, with an audio file that goes with it. You have a list of vocabulary and then you have a grammar explanation of what has just gone on in the dialogue. That doesn't exist for Aboriginal languages. It's simple and it doesn't exist, right? Mm -hmm. All of the materials have been based around giving teachers materials because they're the ones with the knowledge. If you don't have access to a teacher, the materials are useless because you can't access the, the, the linguistic information because there's no explanations. So this is a, this is a project that was started by uh, a linguist called um, doesn't matter. Rao is a surname, I forget. 
uh, who's been Virginia. working with the, with the Tao um, or the Yami community in, in Orchid Island. And uh, she developed, this is, this is a really great, uh, so you, you've got this uh, beginner, intermediate, and advanced levels. So this is the beginner. Um, you have, um, it's thematic, so greetings, introduction, family members, eating breakfast, visiting to, visiting to school, and it gets progressively more difficult. So I clicked on lesson one, no, I didn't. Lesson two, and uh, this is you've got your dialogue, or you've got audio files for everything. You've got uh, translations. It's it's a, a bilingual website. It's just in Chinese and English, which is uh, really nice. So if you want to learn Yami, uh, Yami you can go ahead and do that. Um, then you click on if you see on the sub menu on the left, you click on grammar, and you have a breakdown of things like case marking, determiners, uh, what what is a genitive, and you know how it's used in the possessive as well as a, as, a, as a case marker in a normal kind of grammatical uh, sentence. Uh, things like lo uh, how to use a locative form. Um, this is all very um, um, particular to, to Formosan languages. Uh, then you can click on, uh, we've, got, we've got activities and exercises. Um, this one, activities at the top, you've got with two people in a group, ask each other for names, number of siblings, so you have a, and then, and then for the exercise, uh, students need to write a self-introduction. So it's given you a kind of a pedagogical uh, advice for teachers of how to use that material uh, to teach. Here, here's, now you've got this material with all the files, here's how you can use it in a classroom. Or here's how you can just use it by yourself. Um, so it's, this, this is a really, really excellent uh, um, format. And I think that this should be kind of a standard. But this is the only one I've found. The other languages, I can't find anything remotely similar to that. Um, there needs to be more cultural education of urban Han teachers. So this was, in 2003, the Education Act uh, required teachers uh, working in indigenous areas to, to complete an ethnic, culture, multicultural courses. Um, and all levels of government should comply with the act in five years. But it doesn't apply to urban areas, which is really where we need it. And this is, this is a big problem. Um, there's a nice PDF that I found called the Australian Curriculum Aboriginal uh, guiding principles for promoting and implementing Australian curriculum cross cur cross curriculum priority, and and uh, and that it, it was like a breakdown of kind of how to be more inclusive and culturally sensitive for teachers who are working in Aboriginal areas in Australia, and this this kind of thing should be standard for all teachers in Taiwan, or anyone working in, in any country with Aboriginal uh, Aboriginal populations, um, Aboriginal curriculums. This is uh, just incorporating some indigenous knowledge or histories into the standard curriculum. Okay, this kind of thing could smooth the transition from mainstream education for Aborigines in urban areas. It can educate Han people in the other people that actually live on the island with them and have been living there longer than they have uh, on their views, so they have uh, more cultural uh, sensitivity and understanding, um, as well as the teachers. And, and this, this kind of thing is being, tri is, is being trialed in Canada. Canada's kind of like leading in a lot of these things for their uh, different, different uh, Aboriginal groups. Uh, they have First Nation culture. This, this is a, a second, secondary school program in, in, in Ontario, in Pato, I think. Uh, and they have First Nation cultural values in their curriculum, English courses, select literature that's culturally based uh, on, or, or culturally significant. They have food and outdoor programs that focus on kind of native uh, heritage and cultural, cultural teachings. Um, and this has started to be done by, there was a, a gentleman here uh, a few weeks ago called Daniel Davies, who's a, a former student here, um, and he is now working with uh, local government, the Pingdong local government, to develop uh, a series of uh, Aboriginal uh, English books, but, but they're, they're, they're doing it across, they're doing it across uh, different, different subjects, geography, maths, things like that, um, but he's working on the English one. and. Um, to create some materials that um, are to teach uh, teach English, but with, with an Aboriginal twist. <clears throat> so they have, um, yeah, so the target vocabulary is chosen to be more applicable to local students, reflecting local culture, clothing activities, food, and uh, the local environment. They have traditional stories for the basis of their units. So the traditional stories are in English, but they're about their own culture. Um, so they're, they're already familiar with the, again, it's, it's scaffolding, they're already familiar with the, with the, with the content in that, it, 
the traditional story they may have heard, but now they're learning it in a different way through English. Uh, the same thing goes for using traditional me melodies with English lyrics. This kind of thing is great for Disney films as well, if you know. Mm -hmm. um, uh, activities and games are centered around things like hunting, weaving, and making beads. Uh, and the artwork and illustrations are done uh, via local indigenous artists uh, or people familiar with Paiwan culture. So this, this is a trial. It's currently, the material is being tried across two campuses. Um, um, but, but the idea is to, to assess how effective they are and then to make them available for other Paiwan schools in the Pingdong area. Um, so hopefully that should be um, that should be done sometime, I think, this year or next year. Um, virtual learning, this is pretty cool. I found this. Um, the the Samsung, uh, Samsung Electronics recently partnered with the CIP and Chengchi University to develop a new curriculum that uses digital technology to create immersive and interactive indigenous language and culture lessons. So they, they've selected 10, 10 different indigenous schools from eight different tribes to take part in the first uh, trial of the project. Um, and they, they, they use these, these kind of interactive uh, virtual goggles to, to experience kind of three-dimensional um, aspects of their, of their heritage virtually uh, to gain kind of first-hand uh, educational experiences in a simulated natural setting. I don't know how good it will be, but it's, it's, a, it's pretty good too. Uh, it's very in innovative and uh, you never know. Again, this, uh, this, this, is, this is kind of homing in on the idea of like, people having different modes of learning. I'm almost done. It's like the last two slides or something. Uh, the last thing, I, well, one of the last things I want to talk about is motivation. So, the, generally, people people identify language learning as, as having two motivating factors: what we call intrinsic and extrinsic. Intrinsic is the um, the reasons that you do it uh, for the personal reasons of why you learn a language. You do it because you are interested in the culture, uh, the the sounds of the language. You want to communicate with the community. You might be heritage learners, uh, and it's about cultural pride. Or there are extrinsic reasons, reasons that are outside of you, usually necess necessity, things like you, you need to learn a language to function in society, to improve your social standing, to get better economic benefits, such as learning English to do trade, uh, or to develop certain professional skills that you might want to take with you in the future. Um, the thing is that uh, there's no, right now, language learning in, in Taiwan is purely intrinsic. There is no extrinsic reason for you to learn an Aboriginal language. There's no job opportunities. Um, there, are job, there are people needed to, to translate for hospitals, uh, courts. Um, the el older generation have a language skill, the language ability but no professional skills. The younger generation have professional skills but no language ability. There needs to be a bridge between the two. Um, the reason I've showed these, uh, you've got musicians, uh, Siaman Rapongan is a, an author, um, and then Sidi Kala is a very famous uh, film, the first film in a, in a pure, solely in an indigenous language, the Sidi language. Um, I think the highest grossing film in time in history as well, so it's huge. But um, is that you, you have these kind of new modes of media, um, and, and with that lots, of, lots more employment opportunities. So once Gaelic, for example, in Scotland was made uh, an official language, they opened up BBC Alva, the, the kind of the Gaelic branch of the of, of Scottish uh, BBC, um, and that that created jobs for like reporters, journalists, uh, well everybody who needed to work on the in the industry generally had to have some kind of level of Gaelic. Um, it also spurred the need for Gaelic teachers nationwide. I, I just Googled it um, the other day, just typed in Gaelic teaching jobs, and I got 46 jobs available <laughs> that they can't fill. There's a, there's a need for teachers. Um, Outlander, so like uh, Outlander, if you've ever seen it, it's like a, it's a, it's a stupid show about time traveler, but it, it, they go back to kind of old Scotland and uh, people speak Gaelic, and it's, it's, Americans love it. And, and they, they came over, the, everyone comes over to Scotland from the States to, um, <clears throat> to, to, to revisit their culture and they're obsessed with Gaelic and they're almost to learn Gaelic. Um, so this kind of prompted this whole, this whole thing. Um, the Highlands and Islands have done this Gaelic innovation scheme where they've used, um, businesses are starting to try to uh, incorporate Gaelic into their marketing um, because people think it's cool. Um, and uh, the New Zealand government estimates that the Maori economy is worth about 30 billion US dollars. 
and uh, it's a major force in the nation's economy. Things like media, um, they have two Maori TV channels, dozens of radio stations, growing online digital content. This is all stuff that Taiwanese uh, Aborigines don't have, but need. And uh, you could you could promote culture both um, both for the the love of the culture, but also to create jobs. So, in conclusion, you can all go home. <laughs> Educational focus in Taiwan should be shifted towards strengthening language support in urban areas and uh, for self-learning. Teachers should be educated uh, and have cultural awareness training so they can more effectively work with Aborigines. Aboriginal viewpoints and cultures should be integrated into the national curriculum. Uh, there should be more collaboration between linguists and educational specialists to develop quality scaffolded resources um, with detailed yet accessible grammatical explanations. Uh, and government and industry should invest in creating employment opportunities that are in line with education and that value indigenous language skills, such as tourism, media, education, publishing, and marketing. Thanks very much for your time. Sorry that I went over. Okay, that's, um, that's fantastic. Really, exactly what I was kind of looking for in, in, in a uh, election. I, I could, uh, even though I knew you were kind of going over, I couldn't. I didn't really want to want to stop you. Oh. Last really, uh, uh, questions. <laughs> Fewer questions. Um, I mean, I've got quite a, a few questions, but let me limit us, myself just to the um, just to. Um, I, mean, I actually found with a lot of my questions, you were kind of answering them as you were as you were going along. Um, I had a question about uh, you touched upon uh, the indigenous um, TV station. Mm. Um, um, to what extent does that really play a role? Because you've got um, sixteen something. Uh, languages, mm. uh, and I, from my impression, um, a lot of that TV station is done in Mandarin. Is that right? No. Or is it actually? Uh... No, uh, some. Okay, yeah, right. It's it's mixed, but you have things like it depends. So, for example, the Sakizaya channel, it, it depends on the population. Okay. So, for example, mm. you have about a hundred thousand Amis, and you have less than a thousand Sakizaya. So they a lot. Uh, time, uh, ah, according okay. to mm -hmm. so so um, you turn on the TV usually you hear Amis or something like that. Mm -hmm. Sakizaya you they get one hour a week. Okay, it's broadcast on like a month. Um, the vast majority of it is not based on it. it doesn't have any kind of educational content. Mm -hmm. like, it does have a few for nursery kids, you know, songs and stuff like that. But most it's just kind of it's about Aboriginal issues, things that are affecting pe people. Excuse me, in the community mm -hmm. and in their area. Um, and the reporting is mainly done in Aboriginal languages. Uh, but if you don't speak the Aboriginal language, it's just it's, it's nice to hear it, mm -hmm. but you don't understand anything. And is it, is but it's it better than nothing. And is it something that, that would be used in the classroom, for example? It's too fast. Okay, right. I tried, okay. Oh. I, I tried to use it for my own resources for, for my, my studies, and it's, it's, it's really difficult. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, it's, extre it's extremely quick. Uh, and the and the technol the, te the technological uh, the the technical jargon that they use for for things um, they talk about things like car crashes and you know what's going on like, like mm -hmm. earthquakes and this and that and kids they they're learning how to say like cow and chicken <laughs> you know it, it, it's difficult for them to access the, the kind of vocabulary that's available. I mean, I, um, uh, another kind of very minor question I had well minor actually probably quite important because um, you mentioned one of the big issues is um, indigenous people work living in, in urban areas. So let's say you have one indigenous kid in just one in, in, in a school. Um, would, does, is the school required to actually put together some kind of teaching program for that one kid? If they can find a teacher. Okay, right. Uh, they probably can't. Mm -hmm. And someone like, well, because you have about 16,000 Aborigines living in Taipei, mm -hmm. you may have some teachers, but they'll be spread really thin, um, if there are any at all. But a lot of it will probably done, be done remotely, online, okay. uh, mm. using the materials. If you wanted to, again, it would probably be self-study. They'd have to, uh, I mean, they have like the tribal university there. Mm -hmm. So they, they could probably do a lot of self-study, a lot of listening, practice themselves with the materials online, and then maybe have additional uh, help. But I mean, it's chances are they would just drop it. Mm -hmm. and do something like just focus on English. Yeah. So one of the things I was kind of curious about was uh, the role of local government. You talked about the uh, the project, the Daniel 
Davis yeah, is involved yeah. in. But I was I was thinking someone like Taibe again or or, or, or Gulshman, you have a um, indigenous section in city government. Mm -hmm. Do they get involved in this kind of project? Yes. They they yes, do. Sure. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. A lot of them are funded by, by local government. Like like Hualien, forty five percent of Hualien are Aboriginal. Mm -hmm. So that's as opposed to one percent, two percent of Taipei. Mm -hmm. So there's a huge amount of funding available through local government in places like Kualiam where there's there's a need for it. Mm -hmm. um, there will be there will be funds allocated to like Taipei, but I mean, almost what well, thing is about the problem about Taipei is that you have sixteen thousand Aborigines, but from sixteen different tribes. Okay, mm -hmm. sixteen different languages. So like, how do you accommodate all of these uh, the variety of, uh, of need? Um, in Kualiam, it's easier because you have maybe three or four tribes and they only live. Okay, uh, let's open to question. Johan. It's a small room. <laughs> yeah, you've got it. Yeah. Um, thank you very much. Um, it's very, very interesting. I just, um, I think you kind of touched on it, and I can, I could build my own answer by the different, um, like you're talking about the structural racism and the general lack of resources, but is there much drive or interest in expanding these? indigenous languages to non-indigenous children and getting Han children to learn Amis or um, yeah because it feels at the moment or the picture I got is that it's almost like they're, you're, they're just teaching indigenous languages to indigenous children to keep these languages alive mm -hmm. but they will inevitably slowly die surely um, if any of those children are uninterested and the language can't really grow without some non-native speakers or oh, some non-indigenous children picking it up? Uh, I don't know if that's necessarily true, but what I will say is that it's all about motivation. If you are 98% of the population and you get by just fine with Mandarin, and maybe you got some pressure to learn Hakka or or Minanyu, which is more relevant to your life and to your ancestry, uh, plus all of the other academic uh, pressures. That, I mean, time, time, time in these schooling is not easy. Um, if you're like, well, on top of all this, wouldn't it be fantastic if you learned a language which no one speaks? The vast majority would just be like, no, why would I waste my time? And it, it's about attitude. I think that that, that, that kind of, it, it's all about, again, ex extrinsic motivation. Is there a need? For me to learn that language, there isn't. You have to do it because you want to. Yeah. And and you know, I think. Um, but to, in order to do that, you've got to break down structural issues of racism and marginalization. There has to be a lot of cross-cultural communication and dialogue, which isn't there right now. I mean, um, it's becoming more and more kind of accepted and cool because of, for, at least for the younger generation, because of. Um, uh, I mean, very, very recently, I'm talking uh, because of, because of music and, 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 and film and the media. But the vast majority of people are, are, are looked down on upon Aboriginal people uh, outside of their communities. Um, so I don't see that happening anytime soon. I think that the, the thing is right now is to to make young Aborigines proud of who they are and to and to want to embrace their own culture. First. Okay, yeah, Ivan. Okay, well, um, this gentleman almost asked my question. Oh. Um, ah. and I was going to ask uh, if there are any cases of um, non Aboriginal children learning um, uh, Aboriginal languages in, in, in the schools. Yeah, well, um, I, oh, sorry. I, I think maybe you came in a bit late. Yes, uh, yes, I, yes. I, I, so, yes. No, yes. no, no, I'm not, I'm not like chastising. <laughs> no, why did you? No, it's because uh, I played a video and uh, they had a, it was, it was in an Amis village, but they had a, a Han Chinese student uh, in the school who was doing Amis lessons as well and, 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 and said it was very, very uh, enjoyable. And mainly because probably she was living in, within the community and, and, and had constant kind of access to the culture and, because it was around her. Okay, and, and I just want to, Sort of question, but more of a comment. Um, two uh, European poets, uh, George Campbell Hay, who is probably the, the second most important Scottish Gaelic uh, poet of the 20th century, and Gabriel Aresti, 
who um, uh, many people would say is the most important Basque language poet of, of the later 20th century, neither were indigenous speakers. Uh, George Campbell, a Scots-speaking family, he learnt uh, Gaelic, not through going to classes, but by, when he was a child, uh, uh, talking with and, and, and spending time with uh, the local fishermen um, at Loch Fine. And Gabriel, Gabriel Oresti, um, as an adolescent, chose to learn the Basque language. Now, point is, both these uh, uh, poets um, learnt a language that has uh, a very strong literary tradition mm -hmm. and an audience. Okay, so um, <coughs> languages are so social media anyway, and, and they exist within society. So uh, part of um, a language's um, viability, surely, is, is also its... Um, you know, uh, all the various uh, aspects of culture, that it vehicles. So, um, some kind of literary production um, perhaps would be a good thing. Um, yes and no. The reason I'll say that is because the vast majority of languages are not written down anyway. Um, but vast majority of languages, um, their future is not secure. That's true, yeah. Um, but it's, it's a trade-off, so you might be... Well, they are written down now. Um, that's how you say thank you in Sakizaya. <laughs> um, but uh, you, have, you have issues with... I mean, you say, I mean interestingly enough, you, you mentioned uh, the poet Campbell. Uh, Loch Fine, they don't speak Gaelic there anymore. Yeah, both, and, yeah. and they... Uh, the dialect that they used to speak there has been dead for a long time. You have now when you learn Gaelic, you learn standard Gaelic, which is spoken mainly on the Isle of Skye, even though there are there are dozens of different varieties, uh, which which aren't uh, really written down. Um, that's not kind of part of the literary canon. Um, if you were to write down Aboriginal languages again, you would have to kind of standardize it. Uh, which is at the cost of other dialects. Um, so that's one thing. So say, say you have a, a poet who wants to write about uh, his experience growing up in one particular village where his, his particular dialect of Amis or whatever is, is different from, from that of other places. He would have to do it in a different tongue. He'd have to do it in a standardized tongue or just in Mandarin and just write down about his own experiences in Mandarin. There, there are a lot of, like, oh, I moved it. The guy, the, the Tao author, he writes in Mandarin, even though he writes about indigenous issues and issues about growing up in, on, on his island as an indigenous person. Um, there isn't a canon of indigenous literature. Um, doesn't mean that there can't be one, um, but it's not there. Um, I think, but I, I agree with you, and, and I think that's why online uh, platforms are, are great for that, because um, once, once you have people growing up being able to to be literate to, to be literate to write, uh, then they can start to produce their own resources, their own poems, their own stories, uh, their own dialogues, put it all online, and then you start to have a, a, a literary uh, canon, canon, uh, uh, not canon, what's that, what's that word? Uh, literary culture. It's the word that we always use in linguistics, like a, you, you build a corpus. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> yes. You build a, a corpus of, of material. Um, and that will take time. I agree with you, it's, it's a good idea. But it mean, does, it does you mentioned the Anis have a 100,000 uh, population. Yeah, not 100,000 uh, speakers necessarily, 100, but 100,000 ethnic. Yeah. Okay, well, uh, Faroe Islands, I think it's less than 50,000 people, but they have a flourishing uh, literary culture. Yeah, yeah, it's good they don't speak any other language. Yeah. Yes, go ahead. Um, thank you for your oh, sorry. interesting lecture. And, uh, um, you did your your work in Hawaii, right? Yeah. So I'm wondering, um, what did you find there? If the kids there are um, happy, thanks. Are they happy to learn their indigenous language? I ask this uh, because I work as a school teacher in Taipei for many years before mm -hmm. I came to London, and I, what I found from my students uh, is that they told me they are not happy to learn their indigenous language um, because they feel this kind of language is useless in their, in their daily life. And in their family, they, 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 their parents, they don't communicate with them with this language. And also they complain about 
um, you know, the training of the teacher. They don't really understand, you know, how to um, teach these children really well. So that's what I found, um, maybe just a small sample uh, in Taipei and other area. So I'm wondering, what did you find uh, from your field work? Well, my, I, I think uh, it, it also depends on the age group. So I think kids, young, young children in primary school are probably a lot more uh, likely to enjoy the classes because most of the time it's, it's taught through games, through songs, through dance, uh, and it's just fun. Um, as you get older, when you're a teenager, you don't really want to dance around. <laughs> And, uh, and sing song, songs about frogs, you know, because you're too busy, whatever, going on dates and playing with your iPhone. And I, I think, uh, I, again, when you get older, you start to, there's more exam pressure, there's more uh, need to think about your future, about the decisions that you have to make for, what are the best decisions you have to make in terms of your educational choices. And, and Aboriginal languages fall by the wayside because after they get their proficiency exam, there's no need for them to use their language in daily life. There's no opportunities, there's no jobs, so why bother? Also, you're right, a lot of this is, 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 is structural socially. People don't talk Aboriginal languages to, they don't, they don't teach their kids Aboriginal languages because, not because they don't value them as intrinsically, but because they don't feel there's this notion that if you if you teach a kid, even even in this country, if you teach a kid, uh, if you grow them up to be bilingual, uh, they'll speak English, say, or Mandarin, with an with a funny accent, or it'll take them longer to learn it, or they won't learn it as well, or they'll be stupid at school. This is this is most people in the world are multilingual. Uh, I mean, people in Africa, the average African guy speaks about five languages. The Dutch speak about five languages, and they're all fine. Half of them speak better English than I do. And, uh, and for, for people to have this idea, th this is a big problem in Wales. Pe people didn't want their kids to learn Welsh because they thought they would, uh, it, it would hinder them in the future. This is, like a, this is a, uh, a notion which is certainly uh, carried on in, in, in Taipei. Um, but er erroneously, I think, I think uh, families need to be made aware of that their language is valuable. Um, but again, this is, this is a, you need large scale social change. Uh, it's not just about the kids being fun, having fun when they learn, because man, school's not fun. <laughs> we try to make it as fun as we can, but sometimes the kids just don't want to learn. The motivation isn't there. Languages is, is one of the biggest uh, um, problems, because you know, even in, in, even in schools here, English and maths, they, they, they see the value, because they need to, right? They need to pass it to get a job, otherwise they won't get a job. French, pff, who cares? You know, uh, <laughs> this is this is for, foreign languages in general have a bad rap. But you know, you, you, if you can't use them in in, in, in any kind of uh, professional sense, it's even worse. So it's about large scale change, both both socially uh, and also economically as well. Okay, right. A last question. Sorry, Peter. Do you have a question? You have a question. Yeah, go ahead. Um, I was just going to support your point about literacy and um, I mean the most, some of the most vibrant cultural movements that are happening in English are things like rap music and and you know kids on the street and what's happening if you go and see what's happening in the music scene in the East End of London with you know yeah. multicultural modern English Line. and so on it's it's yeah. that's where the liveliness of, of language yeah. is really and none of this is written down it's not standard yeah. I did have a question which was um I mean, maybe things have changed. I haven't been to Taiwan for a while, but what I saw was kind of internal colonialism happening. Um, we went to this this place at Sun Moon Lake. There yep. was a, a kind of Disneyland thing. <laughs> yeah. And there was dancing and singing, etc. And then we talked to the people afterwards. They were Han Chinese, dressed up as Aborigines. Mm -hmm. um, there was money to be made, but it was being made by Han. It wasn't being made by Aboriginal people. Yeah. So it's kind of cultural... I don't know, uh, is that still going on, that kind oh, of Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. There's kind of cultural assimilation. So they have this... No, um, it's appropriation. It's appropriation. Not that's not, uh, sorry, I meant appropriation. Thanks for correcting. Um, <laughs> no, no, this is... I misspoke. Um, so we, uh, Julie and I, we, we were living... Uh, 
we, we would go often to a village called Chichi, uh, which is a Sakazaya village on the coast. And they have, as you pull up to the village, they have this beautiful layout of um, indigenous um, kind of patterns all over, like the Sakizaya colors, the tribal colors, uh, all over these these buildings, um, which was supposed to be, it was, I think it was it was it was uh, built by the by the government, the local local government, mm -hmm. um, for for the tribe to use as uh, because because it is pretty much the only accessible beach for about a hundred kilometers <laughs> either way, so people go there. Uh, and there's nothing, no development there. There's like a tiny little village, and then you've got this, this beach farm. And they originally built it for the villagers to make a living, but eventually they, they, they the villagers didn't own it, so it was it was owned by the by the um, by the government. And then they 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 rented it out to Chinese businessmen who now sit in these Aboriginal huts uh, with all these Aboriginal colours, selling crap. Uh, and make all the money, but still using uh, the the Aboriginal thing as a as a selling point. So yeah, this this is like, I mean, we'll talk. I think Daniel was talking about this as well. The, the po politicians are using ab they're dressing up like Aborigines to try to yes. promote Taiwan as being different from mainland China. It's it's a political ploy as much as anything else. Uh, it's about um, pushing the the narrative of we all have this kind of this 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 uh, different descent, um, even though it only applies to two percent of the population. Okay, on, on that point, um, let's um, continue our discussion over some some wine. So let's thank uh, Douglas one more time.